We all look back to the past with things we might change. This applies to video games as much as it does anything else. Hi folks, it's Falcon, and today on Game Ranks, 10 things you wish you knew about video games in your childhood. Uh, listen, I don't know exactly when your childhood was, but we're gonna be talking about some games from older eras. Some might be from my childhood, some might be from yours. Let's get moving. Starting off at number 10 with Grand Theft Auto 3, how to actually fly the dodo. Playing GTA 3 for the first time was a magical experience. Right away, everyone just knew this thing was a big deal. At the time, it felt like the game just let you do anything because, to be frank, compared to everything else at the time, it basically did. Except one thing, actually fly the dodo. They cruelly tease you with this small plane set in the runway of uh, Liberty City Airport. You tried and you failed. It lasts maybe three, four seconds. It was not designed to fly. Uh, Rockstar intentionally clipped the plane's wings and made it basically useless. Even back at the time, you'd hear rumors of people actually flying the thing somehow. But if you're anything like me, uh, you couldn't. You'd spend hours and you couldn't. Now, with actual video tutorials as well as detailed instructions, it is actually possible for us uncoordinated slobs to fly the dodo, even if it's still extremely inaccessible. The trick is to hold up on the stick while on the ground, wait for it to start sparking, and then release the stick at the right time to suddenly shoot up into the air, then go back to holding the stick up to keep the plane level. It is as awkward and imprecise as it sounds, but with all the resources available on the internet, it at least takes the guesswork out of it. Speaking of planes that are annoying to fly, another thing I did, uh, and I know a lot of you did, was leave the landing gear down during the flight training in San Andreas. Anyone without actual kid brains would see that's not how planes are meant to control, but, uh, eh. I mean, I'm pretty sure I was a bit older than a kid at the time of San Andreas' release, but, uh, I wasn't old or anything. It was dumb, apparently. At number nine, don't sell your old games at GameStop. This is one, uh, that many of us came to regret. Or, you know, the forerunners to GameStop. Uh, um, <clears throat> EB Games or whatever. <laughs> Man, I do regret trading games in at those places. The fact we were actually able to trade our games in after we were done with them, that was cool. Uh, that'll always be one of the advantages of owning physical games over digital ones, but some of us got fleeced hard. You know how it is too. You bring in a pile of games, you think you're gonna get an easy 50, 60 bucks, you get like 10 bucks. And what do we do uh, as younger, more naive folks? We took it because we were suckers. Without the experience of life, without having become a sucker, you don't have the understanding that you are a sucker. We wanted the new game, hype destroyed our capacity for rational thought, and we just focused on the new thing we'd get. Then it turned out to be a piece of crap we played for like half an hour and gave up on. When you're a kid, money is at a premium and video games are expensive, so if you want more of them, there's gotta be some sacrifice somewhere. But, you know, for a lot of people, we basically gave away a rich collection of fantasy games for, uh, you know, one new mediocre thing. And there's no going back. You could have sold the games for what they were actually worth on eBay or something, but uh, that takes time. Also, eBay was very new when I was a kid. <laughs> and number eight is uh, Driver One. What a slalom is. Simple fact, kids don't know what a slalom is. But when you start up the original driver, uh, they sure did think that you did. The entire opening tutorial mission is notorious for a good reason. It's brutally hard, uh, but at least if a kid can read, uh, they know the instructions. So uh, that means they kind of know what to do. But then you get to slalom and everybody's just like, what? Okay, sure. Uh, every so often you get an extreme sports kid who's played a lot of snowboarding and knew what the word meant. But the rest of us were just baffled. I didn't play a lot of snowboarding games until like, uh, I want to say PS2 era. Driver 1 was PS1. Ah, oh, man, this list is, it's really making me feel old. But, I mean, point is, I was just baffled at this. I, if I had access to an instruction manual, uh, it would maybe light the way, so to speak. But if you bought a game, used, just got a disc, there was no answers. Screw knowing how to finish the tutorial. The real thing I wish I'd known was the cheat code to just skip it. It's not actually that hard of a cheat code to do. So just use the one called skip interview and you're finally free to play the actual game. And number seven, don't roll the cords tightly around the controller. Could have saved a lot of controllers if I had uh, heeded this simple advice. Back when controllers all had cables, 
you had to clean up somehow, so the obvious thing to do was just wrap the cord around the controller. If it wasn't you doing it, it was your mom, but either way, it's probably the number one reason your controllers got destroyed. Well, unless you were one of those psycho children throwing a fit, throwing controllers around the room when you, whenever you died. I wasn't one of those kids, though. Also saying, don't throw your controller would have been a little, little too obvious for a list like this. I mean, come on. Obviously, don't smash your expensive electronics on purpose. Duh. This wire thing, uh, it, it happened all the time, though. And the thing that made it annoying was it took a long time before you really started to see the damage you've done. As with pretty much all electronics, the weak point is where the cable connects to the device. So that's where you want to be the most gentle. Literally, all it took to avoid uh, breaking your controller was just rolling the cord loosely rather than tightly. It's such a simple thing that took me a very long time to realize. Um, Could have saved a lot, of, a lot of money over the years. Probably some games that I traded in. I probably wouldn't have need, needed the money for the controller. And number six, Digimon World for the PS1. Why is my Digimon a poop? The cool alternative to Pokemon back in the day was Digimon, at least for a while. The game you wanted to play if you were into Digimon was Digimon World on PlayStation 1. They beat Pal World to the punch by a lot and for whatever reason, didn't have the same kind of controversy. It was more like a Nintendo versus Sega thing than a Nintendo versus AI bros thing. You know, like a market war rather than a pretending that making something similar is automatically plagiarism war. Oh, and like to call Digimon's designs derivative would be just a massive silly understatement, but uh, we're getting off track. So Digimon World, uh, if you just think like, ah, oh, it's the same thing as Pokemon. I mean, Digimon as a whole, very similar to Pokemon. Digimon World is one of the most obtuse, bizarre, and inexplicable RPGs that has ever existed. This game tests your patience and resolve at absolutely every turn. It's some kind of fever dream or waking nightmare, a creepypasta, but a real game. There's just no better way to explain it. Uh, every kid who's played this thing had the same experience. They'd start it up, wander around completely lost, get beat up by everything in sight, and their Digimon eventually died from neglect. If they did survive, for some reason they'd always turn into a poop monster called Sukumon. Like, yes, that would happen, and no one knew why. Uh, but uh, now, with the power of the internet, I can tell you why. It's because your, your Digimon pooped too much. Seriously, that's what it was. The virus level got too high from all the pooping, so they just turned into a giant literal poop. Did you even know there was a virus meter? Uh, too bad. Guess you should have gotten the guide, which is, by the way, the guide was still riddled with errors. There really was no winning. And number five, you shouldn't use a guest account just to play games. The Xbox 360 was a pretty great console to have as a kid, but depending on your age, it may have just been a little too complicated for your child brain. A lot of people struggled to actually play their games. At a certain age, nobody knows how accounts work or how to set them up. And at the time, your parents might not have known either. Uh, maybe your bigger brother actually owned the Xbox and they refused to let you use their account. So what were your options? Well, just use the guest account. Sure, you couldn't save your progress, but how else were you supposed to play the games? Oh, I'm supposed to make a new account. Sure thing. I, Mr. Child, will be happy to fill out all this information. Now, uh, granted, I was not a child at this time. And nowadays, um, I have children. And uh, you would bet that I have spent a lot of time setting up accounts for them. <laughs> because even though I was an adult when this stuff happened, if, if there was one thing I didn't want to do, it was set up accounts to play games. Uh, that, that sounded like such an irritating prospect to me. But now, like, it, it actually does make a lot of sense because all of your saves are associated with that account. Duh. I don't know. It, 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 it was a lot back then, though. Just a change, you know? I was an adult in the Xbox 360 era, and I feared change. At number four, in Sonic the Hedgehog 3, how those stupid carnival night barrels work, oh my God, 30 years ago. This was the bane of my existence. If you would have told me part of my job would one day be telling you this, the amount of catharsis I would experience as a child would be insane. That said, a lot of people have played Sonic 3 for the first time not 30 years ago, and at any time, if you were a child and you encounter those stupid barrels, you had this problem. So Sonic mostly has a pretty straightforward and understandable momentum, even though sometimes it might get a little fast for people and it might be difficult to keep up with. Most things have a logic to them. Uh, it is not a logic that matches real world logic though. And even by the standards that Sonic operates on, these barrels make no sense whatsoever. They're these hovering, spinning things 
that seem to be blocking your path. They move up and down endlessly, and it seems like you might be able to squeeze through the bottom to get past them, but if you jump and run around and... Uh, they don't do anything. I can't even begin to fathom how much time was wasted on these stupid barrel things. I rented Sonic the Hedgehog 3 the weekend it came out, and I spent from Friday to Sunday when we had to give the game back on these barrels. I thought, uh, maybe momentum, because everything else in the game is momentum. You have to jump on it hard enough that it'll fling you back up, and that's that. No, it's not that. Guess what you have to do? You have to stand on it and press up and down, creating momentum somehow. I don't know why anyone would assume that pressing down does anything here. Imagine convincing your parents to rent this thing. You play it for less than an hour and you get stuck for two days on something this arbitrary. I called tech support the second week we rented this game. That's how I found out what you do here. I can't be the only person that assumed the game was just broken, but it's just something that doesn't make any damn sense at all. And number three, Kingdom Hearts, uh, how you're supposed to uh, do the questions at the start of the game. For some reason, video games meant for kids just love to throw in these arbitrary cryptic bullcrap things because I, I don't know. And you know what? Again, I wasn't a kid when Kingdom Hearts came out. Still. Believe me, I think a lot of this is too cryptic. But in all seriousness, maybe somebody wants kids to just suffer. I, I don't know. This is another one of those games that's been getting re-released a lot of times. So again, we see multiple generations left completely confused and frustrated by something that seems like it shouldn't matter. In this game's case, it's an extremely harmless question, but at least it, at least it makes sense. Picking the paths to the warrior, guardian, or mystic sounds like something like what you'd expect. But then you also have to answer some questions that seem like nothing. However, these questions have a huge effect on how easy or difficult the start of the game is going to be. For some reason, you get a choice of when your journey starts, in the morning, midday, or night, which seems pointless, but uh, it's really not, because if you pick night, you'll level up slower in the early game and later by the end game. Why, why is there a choice about how quickly you level up? I, I don't know. If you're anything like me and you don't know what this is, you end up playing the game on hard mode. You didn't even really know you ended up playing the game on hard mode. It definitely made Kingdom Hearts not good the first time around. And number two, Final Fantasy VIII, how to break the game before leaving the starting area. There's things I wish I knew to avoid making a game harder. Then there's things I wish I knew to completely trivialize an RPG before it's even really started. Um, Final Fantasy VIII is one of those RPGs that a lot of us obsessed over when we were kids, even though we had no friggin' idea what was going on. Final Fantasy VIII makes Final Fantasy VII look fairly straightforward, and I guess, like, for the first third of the game, Final Fantasy VII is, but it gets wacko. Everybody going through the remake make stories is uh is about to start learning how crazy that game gets final fantasy 8 is so much more off its rocker nothing about this game made any sense to me starting with the story but like a lot of stuff was kept secret about this game i mean most kids did not know that the game had adapted difficulty enemies actually got stronger as you leveled up so for kids who love to grind in rpgs uh, which is me by the way there are times that i think that grinding in an rpg is just a calming and enjoyable thing to do enjoy the music enjoy the scenery etc especially with final fantasy 7 VII and 8 where the 3d world map was a completely new thing but that just made the game harder with final fantasy 8 because your stat growth depended more on what magic you junctioned rather than your actual level and um wow did i not know that the two main tricks to break in the game were this never level up and play the card game triple triad grinding for abyss worms from the start these cards can be turned into windmills which can be refined into 20 tornado spells which can in turn be junction to strength and then that makes it easy to do over a thousand of damage per attack like near the start of the game literally right after the tutorial you can do this and it makes the rest of the game unbelievably easy Final Fantasy VIII isn't that hard to begin with, but playing an RPG with a child brain means that any amount of difficulty is going to be at least confusing. Finally, just how to treat your gaming stuff with respect. We were dummies. Our parents gave us all these costly electronics, and we just treated them like total crap. We left discs lying around to get scratched up by the carpet or damaged by the elements. We put the wrong game in the wrong case. Or worse yet, we threw out the boxes entirely. This was before Blu-rays were the standard, so disc-based games were pretty sensitive. Blu-ray was actually pretty damn flexible for optical disc media. These old games, just one little nick or something as minor as a hair, they could negatively affect the disc reader. You had to be extremely careful with PS1 discs, 
and things were only slightly easier with PS2 slash Xbox discs. Like, they would still fail at the smallest imperfection. Maybe not quite as small. I don't know. You'd think we'd carefully guard these things with our lives, but we just didn't know, and we left stuff out, threw it around, were utterly careless, and big surprise, the games would just stop working. In my case, we're kind of talking about siblings. I was actually pretty careful with these things and got pretty nutso when stuff got put in the wrong case or got left out. But that doesn't mean I'm the norm. I lived with the norm and those discs got messed up. Now with digital and physical Blu-ray discs, things work way better, obviously. There's now so much less danger to the games being rendered irreparable. You can still smash a controller, drop a console on the ground, but at least the games are mostly safe, as long as you don't get hacked, obviously, or, or the game gets delisted and the storefront closes down for good. There's really no winning, is there? And that's all for today. Leave us a comment. Let us know what you think. If you like this video, click like. If you're not subscribed, now's a great time to do so. We upload brand new videos every day of the week. Best way to see them first is, of course, a subscription. So click subscribe. Don't forget to enable all notifications. And as always, we thank you very much for watching this video. I'm Falcon. You can follow me on Twitter at FalconTheHero. And we'll see you next time right here on GameRanks.